Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, let's continue our discussion in abnormal psychology. And today we will be talking about disorders related to gender and sexuality. Alrighty, so without further ado. And here we go. Alrighty, first we will talk about um, uh, diagnosis related to gender, uh, gender identity disorder. And we'll talk about the um, complexities of making that diagnosis, yeah? And the larger social political kind of ramifications of that, of this uh, diagnosis. Uh, then we will talk about um, sexual dis uh, disorders, mental disorders related to sexual dysfunctions. And then we will be talking about um, disorders related to the paraphilias. Alrighty, moving right along. So first of all, before we start off our discussion about the mental disorders, just quickly by very quick review, uh, let's talk about um, the biology and psychology of sex. All righty. Uh, first of all, um, just to maybe state the obvious, uh, sexual, human sexual behavior is driven, is affected by hormones in, in that hormones lead to the development of sex characteristics and are involved in the activation of sexual behaviors. Alrighty. However, normal short-term hormonal changes have very little effect on sexual desire. Okay. Large hormone shifts, especially those that occur um, across the lifespan, yeah, you know, changes that occur from um, childhood through adolescence, then young, young, young adulthood through middle age, and then uh, late adulthood, certainly will affect things such as the frequency, intensity, and duration of uh, sexual behavior. Alrighty, but short-term hormonal changes have little effect on sexual desire. It appears that sexual desire is, although in part a function of physiology and hormones, is in large part a psychological phenomenon. Yeah, when we're talking about human sexuality. Alrighty. Um, now, when it comes to the psychology of sex, yeah, the um, psychology or the subjective psychological experience of us. Uh, of sexual activity, sexual behavior um, can be affected both by external stimuli and internal stimuli. All righty. Um, external stimuli, the most obvious example are erotic material. Yeah. Stories, um, videos, pictures, and so on. Yeah. Um, and that a lot of human behavior can be uh, uh, strongly affected by these external stimuli. Yeah. Um, and, but it's also certainly a function of internal stimuli, imagined erotic stimuli. Yeah. This kind of reminds me of a funny story I heard of Albert Ellis, uh, who was the founder of Rational Motor Behavior Therapy. I heard him give a talk. And he had um, not, uh, let the audience know that before he was you know, doing general um, outpatient psychotherapy, like on depression and anxiety, he initially started off a lot of his work um, in terms of sex therapy. Yeah, helping, help, helping, helping those with sexual dysfunctions. Yeah. And he shared with us his story of a gentleman who came to him uh, who had problems coming to orgasm, all righty? Now, like a good sex therapist, you know, Ellis, uh, you know, wanted to assess exactly what the gentleman was doing physically, you know, in terms of a masturbation. Um, and suffice it to say, I won't get into the details, nor did Alice, but suffice it to say, the man knew the mechanics of masturbation, he knew what to do, yeah? Um, then Alice asked him, he said, okay, well, you seem to be frustrated by how long it takes you to come to orgasm. He said, how, how long does it take you to come to orgasm? And the man told him that it took him about an hour or so. And Alice was like, hmm, interesting. Well, you know, um, and I could see why that may be distressing to you. Uh, it, was, it was distressing to the paid client. That's why he brought himself to Ellis's office. Um, so then Ellis asked him, I said, okay, so we know the, the physical mechanics of it. You seem to be doing what most people do. Um, so you're understandably distressed. I said, ah, wait a minute. What are you imagining? What are you thinking to yourself uh, when you're masturbating? And the guy's response was thinking. And Ellis said, yeah, I mean, are you picturing someone, someone you're attracted to, a Hollywood film star or something like that? And the guy said, no. And Alice said, you don't imagine anybody? And the guy said, no, nothing, nobody. <laughs> so Alice said, look, here, I'm going to make my money here. All righty. Um, the next time you masturbate, 
imagine yourself sexually engaging with someone you're attracted to. All righty. And why don't you try that the next time? And that's your homework assignment. And why, next week when we meet, why don't we see how that turned out? Okay. So the guy leaves, uh, comes back the next week. And Ellis goes, oh, how did things go? And the guy said, oh, really well. And Ellis said, okay, so this time you imagine someone. And he, the guy said, yeah. And he said, oh, well, how long did it take you to come to orgasm? And the guy said, oh, about 45 seconds. All right. So what is the, well, it's not, it's not really moral to the story, but the point of the story, the point of the story is that human sexual behavior is in large part, um, you know, although there's a physical, biological component to it, yeah, um, in terms of what leads someone through the process and to a satisfying experience, but also a large part of it is a cognitive or psychological or subjective component of uh, human behavior. Now, let's first, of the um, types of mental disorders, let's first talk about um, gender dysphoria, okay? Now, gender dysphoria uh, is, um, is characterized by strong and persistent cross-gender identification, meaning, as a general matter, if one is chromosomally a male, XY, yeah, has a strong and persistent identification as a woman, or if it's an XX female, Right? She has a strong, persistent gender identification uh, to be a male. Okay? And, there's, and it's also characterized by a persistent discomfort with their own sex. Yeah? And this is not just a slight discomfort or um, it, it's a powerful one. I mean, how powerful, you know? Um, just to illustrate, uh, for many, uh, they feel that the body is not right for them. Yeah? Uh, there are a number who feel that if they could, you know, they would have their um, chromosomally determined, you know, uh, genitalia removed, you know, and fantasies of being able to uh, remove them themselves. Yeah. Uh, and often um, the subjective experience that their chromosomally determined genitalia may be something that um, disgusts them, you know, or something that is ego dystonic, something that doesn't fit with, at the very least, doesn't fit with who they are. Okay, now to suffer from gender dysphoria, yeah, um, you need to uh, experience these symptoms for about six months. Okay, so it's not something that's just passing like for a week. Um, and it also, here's a really important thing. Yeah, um, now before I get into this, what's really important is that gender uh, dysphoria, yeah, often referred to gender identity disorder, is um, often confused as being synonymous with being transgendered, okay? It's not, okay? I remember hearing on the news one time, some political figure referring to being transgendered as a mental disorder, okay? It is not, okay? Now, gender dysphoria is a diagnosis, it's a psychiatric diagnosis related to this experience of being transgendered. But to be diagnosed as suffering from gender dysphoria, Here's the key thing. Here's the key thing that the political figure on television totally overlooked or didn't understand. Um, you know, the latter is a little more understandable. Maybe they consciously overlooked it, don't know. But to be diagnosed as suffering from gender dysphoria, the individual has to be suffering from social or occupational problems or distress. Meaning that the first two um, prongs um, of this diagnosis needs to be uh, associated with causing problems in social occupational functioning or it's distracting the person. Now, if you don't have problems in social occupational functioning and you're not distressed about it, you're just transgendered. You're not suffering from a psychiatric mental disorder. And that's really important to keep in mind, all right? And gets kind of lost or confused uh, with people, all righty? So being transgendered, it's not like what we did with homosexuality uh, prior to 1977, where homosexuality was a, a diagnosable disorder. Transgenderism is not, okay? Not, neither is homosexuality. I'm pretty sure I stated that earlier. Okay, now what is the ideology of, um, you know, gender dysphoria or trans, transgenderism? Well, there seems not, there's a, there are a number of studies yeah, uh, both animal and human studies, which seem to show a biological component, okay? It's still relatively under, not understood, 
all righty. But it seems to involve some kind of hormonal process in the first trimester, yeah, where there may be greater exposure to um, hormones for the um, opposite gender, yeah, in the fetus. Um, but the evidence is still, you know, still, the jury's still out on this, all righty. Um, some have posited that it may be due to psychological uh, factors that occurred in early uh, with in childhood upbringing. Yeah, but the evidence is def is certainly lacking in this area as well. All right. What do we know in terms of what's effective treatment for those suffering from gender identity disorder, gender dysphoria? All righty. Well, you know, we tried talk therapy for a few couple decades, and what did it do? Next to nothing. Zero. All righty. Well, maybe for some, but um, for the most part, most people uh, couldn't be talked that can't be talked out of it. All righty. Uh, it's very similar to the homosexual experience, bisexual experience. You can't talk someone out of that. If you want to give it a go, good luck. All righty. Uh, we know that with the sexual orientation treatment, no evidence that that's effective. All righty. What little evidence that suggests that it's effective. <laughs> usually is a questionable um, empirical methodology, all right? They're not real experiments and it's questionable who the subjects were and uh, what their motivations were to respond that the treatment was effective. All righty, evidence doesn't support it, all righty. The one thing that seems to be effective in making people feel better, yeah, is sex reassignment surgery. Alrighty. Now, for those who are interested in sex reassignment surgery, it's not just a matter of going to your doctor and saying, I want to be the opposite gender. Alrighty. Because it is an involved complex um, type of surgery, yeah, it, the, the determination of someone who um, would most benefit from that surgery is involved. It involves psychological assessment, psychological testing, interviewing. Uh, it usually prior to surgery, as um, you know, part of the process to gradually um, have the person take on this new physical identity, but also as a um, part of the process of establishing whether the person really wants to make this, because it is a dramatic change, yeah. And in many respects, yeah. In most respects, it's there's no turning back <laughs> once you've uh, completed the surgery. Alrighty. So it often involves a period of anywhere between a year to a couple of years of hormone treatment as well. Yeah, with for males breast development and for females, um, the development of uh, secondary sex characteristics typical in males like uh, um, growth of facial hair and so on, all via through hormone treatment. Yeah, uh, for many individuals, uh, the changes that they acquire via hormone treatment um, and adopting other physical uh, physical aspects of being the other gender, like how they dress, uh, how they present themselves physically. For many, that's sufficient. Yeah, um, but for but, uh, for those who suffer from gender dysphoria, it's very common that ultimately it's to have the surgery for the male, the removal of the penis, and the construction of a um, you know via plastic surgery of a vagina, not of a reproductive system. Yeah, uh, and for females. Um, it may involve um, the development of some form of a penis, um, but for many female transgenders, uh, just because in terms of the technology, the medical technology of constructing a, um, you know, uh, a phallus, a penis uh, for female is so complex and they often don't function quite as well as uh, most people want, would like at this point. Um, that many forego um, the medical, the surgical, the forego the surgical construction of a penis. Okay, and surgeries though tend to show um, good long-term results. Okay, and that most patients tend to be satisfied with sex reassignment. Yeah, but because again the change is dramatic. Yeah, as plastic surgery can be, but certainly of this sort. Um, you know, the uh, psychological assessment and gradual hormonal treatment is really critical to make sure that this kind of uh, procedure is appropriate uh, for the uh, patient. Alrighty then, let's get into um, 
sexual dysfunctions. Now, sexual dysfunction disorders are organized along the physiology of the sexual response. Yeah. For those of you who've taken human sexuality um, or maybe um, other biology courses, general science courses, you may have heard of these four phases. Yeah, The phase of desire, then arousal, orgasm, and then resolution in, yeah, after the orgasm in this sequence. All righty. Um, so, so the mental disorders or sexual dysfunctions are usually organized along these four phases. Yeah, not, not resolution. We, there aren't really resolution, uh, you know, uh, diagnoses, but primarily for the first three. So regarding the sexual dysfunctions, they concern persistent problems with sexual interest, arousal, or response. All righty, here we're talking about orgasm. Now let's look at the different types. Okay, and as with any disorder, what comes into play is almost that first thing we talked about in abnormal psych. Yeah, the question of what is abnormal? What is a normal amount of uh, desire, arousal, you know, uh, orgasm, and so on? Okay, um, well, we'll look at that, how that's kind of um, established. Okay, or determined by the diagnostician. Um, so first of all, disor dis disorders. Disorders involving lack of sexual interest or arousal. Here we're talking about desire, the first phase. Yeah, there's male hypoactive sexual desire disorder, and which is characterized by creating absence or lack of sexual interest or desire. But again, here's the big question. What is a normal amount of desire? Yeah, um, so we're here, we're talking hypoactive, right? A lowered amount, yeah? So what if someone is, you know, masturbates once a day? Is that average? or once a week, or once a month, or once a year, yeah, or hardly at all. Um, so what's normal, yeah? Um, in this situation, ultimately, as we're gonna see with a number of the uh, uh, sexual dysfunction disorders, yeah, ultimately the, the analysis turns on, is it distressing to the patient, all righty? Now, uh, that may seem obvious. Sometimes it is obvious, sometimes it's not. Yeah, what's not so obvious sometimes is why is a person in your office, what, what brought them to a counseling center or to uh, uh, see a psychologist? Yeah, a lot of the time it's because they, they're they distressed and they want to um, uh, change this problem. Sometimes it's a partner <laughs> pressuring them to um, change, all righty? Um, and so that's what you need to kind of sort out. Are they? Are they there, right? Are they distressed because it bothers them? Or are they there because it bothers somebody else? And that, that's an important thing to kind of sort out, yeah? If it's more the latter, yeah? If it's, if it's the former, then there are a lot of individualized treatments, yeah? Uh, there, there, there's clearly individualized treatments for that. If it's more the latter, yeah, it may be more um, an issue of couples treatment, yeah? All righty. So, um, you know, it, uh, it's an absence of lack of sexual interest or desire. Um, now, among the things, and this goes for a lot of the other dysfunctions, you need to judge the deficiency in light of age and other factors that can affect sexual function. Other factors could be, you know, um, stresses at work or school, all righty. Um, so, or, you know, family stressors and so on right? Um, the amount of what's normal sexual desire certainly is a function, will differ for the adolescent, young adult, and versus go through the lifespan through to the uh, elderly person. Okay. Now the distress, right, and the absence of uh, sexual interest or, or desire needs to last for, here's the magic number, six plus months. Alrighty, and you also still need to be able to um, differentiate it from, let's say, substance abuse or some um, medical biological condition, relationship problems, as we just kind of pointed to, okay, any other mental disorder, maybe the lack, it's not uncommon for those who are suffering from, you know, depression to have a lack of uh, a, um, sexual interest or desire. So the problem, the primary problem may be a mood disorder, not a sexual disorder, alrighty. We have uh, female sexual intercourse or arousal disorder. Again, uh, what is the amount of interest a woman should have 
in sexual behavior or arousal, all righty. Well, it, again, it turns on, is it distressful to the patient? That's what's key, their subjective concern. All righty, and again, if this lasts for about six plus months. Um, another interest arousal disorder is erectile disorder, ED, as many of us are probably well familiar with, uh, as we frequently hear of advertisements on the television for medications to cure e uh, erectile disorder. All righty. Um, and it, this needs to persist for about six months again. It has to be distressful to the patient. And here are some of the other conditions you want to be sure is not actually in play as opposed to ED. Disorders involving impaired orgasm, okay? So here we're not talking about interest. Um, previously we spoke about um, arousal, okay? Uh, so the desire may hyperactive desire, uh, interest arousal in the female, then erectile disorder. Here we're talking about organ impair impairment in the uh, orgasm response. Okay. Um, similarly, we have it uh, kind of broken down by gender. We have female orgasmic disorder. It's probably the most common sexual dysfunction presented by women. It has to last for about six months. And again, distressful to the patient. Uh, you can have delayed ejaculation. Okay. So here's a situation where the male is able to get aroused, able to uh, attain an erection, but it takes the uh, individual a long time to come to ejaculation. Yeah. Some patients who uh, suffer from delayed ejaculation and suffer, meaning that, you know, in their um, sexual interactions, it, it takes them a long time to come to ejaculation, all righty. Um, and by long time, you know, some patients, when they present this as a problem, they'll talk about how it takes them two to three hours, yeah, um, and which could be distressing to their partner. Um, and. And how could it be distressing? Well, not just in terms of the amount of time it takes them um, to come to um, orgasm. Once the partners come to orgasm, now the person with delayed ejaculation, how much longer it takes them, but also in terms of the relationship, right? The partner uh, perceiving or misperceiving that um, the person with delayed ejaculation is not sufficiently aroused by them, all righty? So you can see it can have a very powerful effect on uh, relationships, yeah? Uh, this problem has to last for about over six months and again, distress to the patient. Yeah. The other is premature early ejaculation. Okay. This is probably uh, more common, although delayed ejaculation is certainly something um, that a physician may encounter from a patient, but probably more commonly so premature early ejaculation. Okay. The recurrent inability to exert any control over again, ejaculation. Yeah, one who comes to ejaculation uh, quicker than they and or their power, uh, partner would desire. Okay, but ultimately, right, it's if it is distressing to the patient. All righty. Um, so let's see. And again, we come to the question, you know, uh, how long should someone maintain an erection, a male, uh, uh, should a male, right, well, obviously male, should <laughs> maintain an erection um, before uh, coming to ejaculation, yeah? Uh, is it 15 minutes, five, a minute, right? It's a judgment call, right? For the individual and or the partner, all right? But ultimately, right, to be diagnosed, it should be something that's distressing uh, to the patient. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna skip um, disorders involving pain during intercourse penetration. Um, Here's a study kind of dated uh, by Lauman and all, examining the frequency of problems as reported by a sample of men and women. Here are some of the problems and what proportion are reported by women and what the percentage of women uh, reporting these problems and the percentage of men reporting this pro these problems in, in this particular sample. Okay, uh, pain during sex, 14% uh, of women, only 3% of men. Sex not ple pleasurable, single digit for males, 21.2% for females. Unable to reach orgasm, 24.1% for females, 8.3% uh, for males. And lack of interest in sex, 15.8% in males, 33.4% in females. Yeah, about a third of females. And pretty high for males too, about 16%. Um, Anxiety performance, now here where things kind of flip, 17% uh, of the sample of males only, well, less so in females, 11.5. About 
a third of males in the sample uh, uh, concern anxiety about reaching climax too, er uh, too early, whereas only one out of 10 females do. Um, unable to keep an erection about one out of 10 males and having trouble lubricating about 20%, all close to 20% of the women in the sample, okay? So a lot of these problems, um, you know, not so rare. And also it's just kind of interesting how the particular problems kind of flip um, across genders. Okay, so what are some, what are the, some of the causes, the etiological uh, contributors? to uh, sexual dysfunctions. Yeah, certainly um, medications can have an impact on sexual desire. Some antidepressants can decrease libido. Yeah, it can be a very kind of unpleasant negative side effect for those who are, pe for those who are already depressed about other circumstances uh, in their lives. Um, a lot of changes are a function of aging. You know, so as people go through middle age, um, there's a decrease in a lot of things, <laughs> decrease in blood circulation uh, for males, a significant decrease in testosterone. Um, female sexual arousal may be impaired by hormonal imbalances. Yeah? Um, and getting back to circulation, decrease in circulation in both males and females can uh, lead to a decrease in oxygen, well, for males, oxygen in the blood in the penis um, and so on. Yeah. Uh, Substance abuse should also be assessed. Yeah, uh, if someone is having suffering from an erectile disorder, yeah, uh, one of the things you might want to see is if they're also um, having a problem of abusing alcohol. All righty, uh, the two can be related. And there are certainly psychological contributors. Yeah, as we mentioned before, um, certainly biological uh, causes. Um, should be explored as, as, as well as um, uh, medications which can address those biological causes or exercise or diet and so on. Yeah, for some, it may be hormonal treatment, okay? Uh, but there are clearly very often psychological factors. Yeah, very powerful ones. Uh, they can be just as powerful, if not, as more, if not more powerful uh, than the biological ones. That's kind of pointed out in that uh, Albert Ellis example. Yeah, uh, just because people are doing the right thing mechanically or physically, you know, if they're thinking certain things, imagining certain things, they can really undermine, you know, what's going on in the physical world. Um, certainly negative emotional states can decrease sexual arousal. Yeah, people suffering from mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and, and so on. Yeah. For the for the erectile reflex, right, it's, it's a reflex, so it's dependent on the peripheral nervous system or, or a relaxed state. Yeah. And the more people get anxious about sexual performance and so on, more you have an increase in the sympathetic nervous system yeah, and a decrease in the peripheral nervous system. So when the peripheral nervous system goes down, you have a decrease in the erectile reflex. Right? You just can't you know, bring that on voluntarily. Alrighty, it's a reflex uh, which is supported by relaxed state or the peripheral nervous system. Alrighty, what the sympathetic nervous system is more likely to foster is ejaculation. Alrighty, so for delayed ejaculation, there's something about um, increasing the sympathetic nervous system. But the more we're aroused, right, we're anxious, uh, and you have an increase in the sympathetic nervous system, you're more likely to have a, a, a more likely to ejaculate and that might be at play for the person suffering from um, uh, premature ejaculation. Alrighty. Uh, from a psychodynamic perspective, a lot of these problems may arise from unconscious conflicts. Yeah. So from a Freudian or psychodynamic perspective, if someone is having difficulty with sexual behavior, it may reflect unconscious uh, feelings of conflict or maybe feelings of anger, resentment to the partner, which they can't consciously allow, but will manifest in uh, the sexual problems, uh, some, some of the sexual problems to be just described. Yeah. Um, aside from psychodynamic, um, the um, psych, uh, sexual pr uh, problems may be related to relationship problems, yeah? uh, conflict, anger, um, other problems yeah? uh, going on in the relationship. Uh, uh, such that the um, sexual behavior, the responses are function more about feelings related to the relationship as opposed to sexual um, behavior per se. 
right? So learning theory, uh, a lot of sexual behavior is simply a skill, yeah? just like uh, any other social skill and so on. And like any skill, it can be learned. Yeah. And for some, it's just a matter of learning certain skills, um, certain ways of um, relaxing oneself to be engaged in sexual behavior um, and so on. And in a lot of, in a lot of the time, uh, you know, developing, lear learning these skills um, or being educated, yeah, in terms of, um, you know, how to engage in sexual behavior can have a huge uh, difference. Yeah, and may require only one or two sessions. Uh, depending on the problem and and um, and the individual, as kind of illustrated with the Ellis example again, that example is not such a rare example of uh, the of how effective uh, sexual um, therapy uh, for sexual uh, problems uh, can be. Uh, cognitive therapy certainly has a play, and one of the ways uh, cognition certainly have, has a place in terms of attitudes and beliefs about sexual behavior, particularly about performance, and particularly about how one evaluates what's happening. Yeah. Are they, you know, for someone who may not be suffering from um, sexual problems, when they encounter premature ejaculation or de delayed ejaculation, if they're not uh, coming to arouse, if a female's not as interested or aroused, it's what they say about that event. Right? Are they saying things to themselves such as, you know, oh, this happens, it's not the end of the world, you know, I'm just not feeling it this particular time, but later I'll, you know, I'll probably feel differently. And, you know, and there are other things that a couple can do uh, where they, whereby they can enjoy their company, <laughs> each other's company. Or are they, are they telling themselves, you know, I'm a failure, um, you know, um, I'm not a man or I'm not a woman uh, because I'm not responding in a certain way, you know, because they're not responding like what they see porn stars responding um, in porn and so on. And, you know, and there's no small number of people who have incredibly unrealistic, sometimes odd expectations about how they should perform or act, you know, what they think they see online on some porn video. They think that that's what human beings, you know, that's how they should behave. Hey, maybe some behave human beings, that's how they behave. But there, if there's anything uh, with sexual behavior, um, as you probably learned in human sexuality or other classes, you know, there are many ways um, people can enjoy each other's company or enjoy themselves. Um, you know, there's no one way. And, you know, that those are among the beliefs. Uh, and beliefs are sometimes attitudes in self-statements, uh, automatic thoughts, but there are also even images people have in their mind yeah. And if you also include, um, besides performance, you know, things like body image and stuff like that, uh, that certainly can have a positive and or really negative impact on um, sexual behavior. And certainly early sexual trauma uh, can have a negative effect on um, sexual behavior. Yeah, or certainly enjoyment of uh, sexual activity. All righty. Um, here are some of the treatments. Um, I'm going to kind of leave this to your review in the text and the PowerPoint. Um, this is something we can talk about later, a kind of a fact pattern and where do people stand with this, but this is something we might uh, talk about in um, when we meet face to face. Okay, next let's talk about the paraphilias, but with that, let me pause for a moment. Okay, thanks everybody for your patience. And with that, let's continue. All right, so the paraphilias is the other category of besides gender dysphoria and the sexual dysfunctions. This is the other big subcategory, the paraphilias. Now, the best way to think about paraphilias is that it involves sexual arousal to atypical stimuli. Okay, I put atypical in capital letters because uh, that's um, relative, right? Um, so we're gonna be talking about sexual arousal to certain stimuli. And to some of you out there, it may not sound so atypical. It may be typical to you. Um, so we gotta be, again, keep in mind it's uh, relative, all righty? Now, uh, it's also characterized by recurrent powerful urges and fantasies lasting about six months or longer. Okay, so we're not talking about something that kind of catches your attention and thrills you one evening, um, but something that's persistent for about six months or longer. Focus on either non-human objects, we'll talk about uh, the, the uh, diagnoses that fall under this 
category. Humiliation or experience of pain uh, onto oneself or another, sadism, masochism. And then the one that is particularly concerning uh, that is focused on children or those who do not grant consent, yeah, like exhibitionism, voyeurism, and, and so on. Okay, pedophilia, obviously just uh, mentioned. Okay, though that, that is particularly concerning and serious um, and serious types of mental disorders. Okay, they have to either cause a person distress or impairment in functioning, or uh, you don't have to have even that, right? We usually have uh, social occupational functioning or distress. Here's another um, possibility, Con huge conjunction or, or involves behaviors in the past or present in which satisfaction of the sexual urge involved harm or risk, a risk of harm to others. Yeah, so this certainly is a necessary component when we're talking about like pedophilia, yeah? It doesn't matter if the pedophile is not distressed. It doesn't matter if the pedophile, it's not appearing uh, his, usually his, uh, social occupational functioning. If it involves behaviors that in the past, present or past um, in which satisfaction of that urge involves harm or risk of harm to others, then it qualifies, okay? Uh, it will, um, be a diagnostic criterion that counts towards being diagnosed as suffering from a particular paraphilia disorder. Okay. Some of this stuff we'll get into when we meet face to face, we'll discuss that. Um, it's kind of an exercise about how to think about um, sexual behavior and what's abnormal and normal, but we'll have a discussion on what I just went through real quickly uh, when we meet face to face um, and or on Zoom. Now, the first category, non-human objects, yeah? Um, one of the first uh, disorders is fetishism, okay? So you've heard the term fetish. It involves, the, it involves being sexually aroused by a non-living object, okay? What are some common non-living objects? They may be um, uh, material um, objects made from certain materials like leather or plastic, yeah, like shoes, purses, things of that sort. Okay, um, some uh, um, it, uh, the, uh, the symptoms has, have to last for six or more months and it has to cause distress or a decrease in social occupational functioning. Okay, some may have a food fetish. Um, oh, you know, a very bizarre case, very rare. Uh, some, uh, uh, well, may again, it's relative, right? Um, you know, uh, being, uh, you know, uh, some have a fetish towards feces or urine, all righty? Very, you don't run into that very often. Um, or people who have that interest, they sure as heck won't tell very many people. There was this one really unusual case I read from a DSM case book where this was the fetish that a guy derived um, sexual arousal and would come to orgasm if he could have um, contact, right, with male feces. And this is what, it specifically though, specifically what he would do is that he would hang out in the men's room and, you know, I guess, I don't know, wash his hands. I don't think he'd just be standing there. He'd probably freak people out. Um, but he'd go into men's rooms, you know, keep himself busy and wait for someone um, to enter the bathroom to, um, you know, defecate and hold hopefully not flush it down. And then when that person would leave, he would enter the stall that the person was just, that the person just came from. And with a plastic bag, he would, you know, with his hand wrapped in a plastic bag, he would reach in, grab the fecal matter and then hold it. And it was the warmth of the fecal matter that would get him aroused. And I think get him to uh, orgasm as well. Very bizarre, you really hear <laughs> something like that. But that is a non-living object. Uh, which was a focus of that individual's fetish, okay? Uh, now you can imagine when someone has a fetish like that, right? Um, it may distress them, right? Um, it certainly may impair social occupational functioning. If their friends find out, if they do it, at, they can't stop themselves, you do it at work and they get into trouble. Um, so certainly, you know, you can see someone, some fetishes you'll never get into trouble with, right? You just keep your boots and leather boots and leather purses at home and, you know, and so on. Shoes um, are another common fetish. 
And by the way, as an aside for paraphilias, uh, between men and women, men far more than women, you know, suffer from paraphilias. Yeah, you occasionally have some women, usually, uh, usually it's a guy. Um, and sh shoes are another one, you know, where guys get aroused by touching shoes and sometimes can't come to orgasm unless they're touching a woman, specifically a woman's shoe. Okay, could be a pantyhose, could be, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, undergarment panties, women's panties, um, and so on. Those are some of the common ones. Transvestic fetishism. Now, what this refers to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it, it, it refers to a male persistently dressing in women's clothing to achieve sexual arousal. Okay, so that's what's meant by transvestism. Okay, not to be confused with uh, gender identity disorder. Yeah, where uh, let's say a chromosomal male dresses, <coughs> excuse me, as a woman because he identifies with being a woman. Okay, here you're talking about a male, very uh, typically heterosexual male, who wants to dress in women's clothing in order to get aroused or come to orgasm. Yeah, it may be. Uh, wearing a woman's dress. Many forms actually involve the uh, male, uh, excuse me, <coughs> um, wearing, sometimes just wearing women's pantyhose or wearing the woman's panties, right, or undergarments. Uh, for some who have a transvestic fetishism, uh, they can actually, um, you know, function fine. Um, they have no problems with going to work or socializing with friends because unbeknownst to their friends or coworkers, they're wearing women's undergarments beneath their uh, whatever, uh, Dockers pants <laughs> or jeans or whatever they're wearing, right? Um, now, a very common process for those with transvestic fetishism, again, usually males, is that uh, wearing the women's clothing uh, allows them to come to arousal or orgasm. But very often, over time, it doesn't even serve that function. It serves a function, though, of helping the uh, male feel relaxed or it calms them down. That's a very common report from someone who's been um, uh, participating in being involved in this kind of fetishism over years. Okay, um, now they have to present this, uh, this uh, behavior for six more months and it's gotta be distressing them or, or affecting social occupational functioning. Yeah, so you can see with a lot of these, right, as we spoke about uh, fetishism and transvestic fetishism, not a lot of these, we're just starting, my apologies. Um, if it ain't bothering <laughs> them at work or their friends and they're not distressed, they're not diagnosable. All righty. And very often what brings a person into therapy is being caught, right? Or having a partner who's not very thrilled with it. And again, ultimately it's whether the individual is distressed, but you know, if your partner is not happy with it, if your partner is gonna end the relationship or marriage <clears throat> because of the a fetish, then um, yeah, it's obviously gonna cause the individual uh, distress. All righty. Oh, stupid cartoon, Popeye cartoon. Popeye, no, I am what I am. Transvestic fetishism. Okay. Um, let's see, other types of uh, paraphilias um, uh, include uh, stimuli such as obscene phone calls, corpses, uh, one specific part of the body. Some people have a thing for feet. Uh, animals, feces, as I mentioned before, enemas, uh, urine, uh, piercing, marking, you know, marking the body, tattoos. Um, now, tattoos and piercings and marking the body is absolutely fine, obviously, uh, can be quite beautiful. Um, but when someone is doing the tattooing or the piercing or the marking of the body because it sexually arouses them, yeah, and this is the focus of how they get sexually aroused, it could be a problem. Yeah, uh, because if you want to be continually such a house and it's and it's a tattoo, you might be making a judgment of having additional tattoos, not for the aesthetics, but for the sexual arousal and orgasm. Yeah, and you only have so much, you know, surface area to tattoo, uh, so that certainly could bring about a possible problem for the individual. 
can't oh, bypass sexual sadism, masochism. I think those are um, fairly straightforward. All righty then, the other category were children or others who do not grant consent. Yeah, so this category, this is the one that's um, dangerous and concerning. Okay, all righty. Now, first, uh, exhibitionism. Yeah, some, those individuals are focused on sexual arousal orgasm by exposing their genitals to unwitting and usually unwilling strangers. All righty. Uh, so the, the person to whom they're exposing themselves, right, isn't um, a partner or someone who's, uh, you know, sexually involved with them. Yeah, the idea is that what's arousing is to do it to someone who doesn't give consent, who doesn't want to see that. All righty. Uh, this has to persist for about six months. This is one of those, it's probably gonna uh, involve, um, if not direct social occupation functioning, person's bound to uh, get into some kind of trouble with the law, right? A very common way some um, male exhibitionists do it is that they'll do it from their car, right? They'll approach someone on the street, they'll drive the car up maybe to um, a bus stop and then expose themselves, all righty. So in due time, you can only get away with that for so long until maybe the police catch up with you. All righty. Voyeurism. This is observing the naked body and, and the disrobing or the sexual activity of an unsuspecting victim. Okay, so that's really clear to keep in mind. That's why it's Captain Bo, the unsuspecting victim, someone who doesn't give consent. Yeah, that's kind of the running concern here. Okay, so it doesn't include watching porn, right? Or it doesn't include watching a um, willing, like sexual partner disrobe, like your spouse or dating partner. It's someone who doesn't know you're watching them. All righty. So foyers may, uh, you know, come on, uh, walk onto the property of a neighbor, might use binoculars, right? And peer into the adjoining building, all that kind of stuff. This is another one. Right, uh, which even if it doesn't directly affect social occupational functioning, very often voyeurs eventually get caught. Right, it has to last for more than six months. Uh, Fracturism uh, involving recurrent powerful sexual urges, fantasies, or behaviors in which a person becomes sexually aroused by rubbing against or touching a non consenting person. All righty, um, uh, in New York City. Uh, this is one you hear about every now and then, you know, a fracturist, um, you know, um, taking care of their, um, their needs by going onto a busy subway, all righty, uh, could be another one could be a popular, popular one, another one you don't, uh, you hear <laughs> very often are city buses, right, where um, the fracturist could rub against someone, right, um, an unknowing victim, uh, to get aroused and become to orgasm as well. All righty. Another one which uh, often gets uh, eventually arrested. Okay, finally, pedophilia. Yeah, the, 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 I mean, all of these are concerning, but certainly pedophilia, the most concerning because the victims are uh, children, a okay, vulnerable population. Um, so this is where someone displays over a period of six months recurrent sexually arousing fantasy, uh, fantasies, urges, or behaviors involving sexual activity with a prepubescent child or children, okay? Generally age 13 years or younger, all righty? Uh, rarely are victims infants. Uh, there can be in some cases, um, let's see, uh, but, you know, beyond infancy, toddlers um, and, you know, and so on through uh, uh, prepubescent um, children, uh, you know, are common. Yeah, you know, common victims. Um, and the person has acted on these urges or the sexual urges cause marked distress or interpersonal difficulty, okay? So you do not need to have acted on this to be diagnosed as suffering from pedophilia, all righty? As long as there, there are uh, persistent uh, sexual urges that it's causing the person distress or interpersonal difficulty, which they invariably will. Uh, it is kind of interesting. It's not a one-time uh, incident, right? One moment or fantasy, but it is something that's demonstrating a pattern. Yeah. And as an aside, you rarely hear of people or cases where someone has a sexual urge towards a child that just lasts a week. Okay. Most commonly, uh, well, you know, if they exist, 
no one's going to hear about it, right? So I'm not aware of any good research that shows um, that has found a bunch of people who have this urge that lasts a week, right? Because most people probably will never ever report an incident of that sort. Okay, um, but so as far as we know, when it happens, it's usually a pattern. Yeah, and something that lasts for at least six months. But is it possible for someone to have had an urge for a few days? Yes. I suppose it's possible. You just don't really hear of those cases. Okay, now the person um, who's suffering from this has to be at least age 16 years, okay, 16 years or older, and at least five years older than the child or children. Okay, so the youngest it can be 16 and with a five year difference between them and um, their object of desire, right? An 11 year old, okay? It does not include late adolescent, here we're talking 18, in a continuing relationship with a 12 or 13 year old, okay? Uh, so maybe it's a senior in high school who is going steady with a freshman, all righty, something like that, who, you know, uh, uh, a young freshman, that wouldn't count, all righty? Um, and in a continuing relationship, not someone who's just, you know, um, interested in 13 year olds uh, as, as he becomes 19, 21, 35, and so on, all righty. Then in that situation, you clearly can qualify suffering from ped pedophilia, but the 18 year old going steady with the 13 year old, not the case. All righty, in terms of the etiology um, of pedophilia, I think I'll leave that to the text and the PowerPoint. Uh, I don't think we'll be getting into this, 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 this topic. And with that, um, I mean, I encourage you to read about it um, through the PowerPoint. Um, but, you know, just as an aside, I'm, you know, to having discussion on rape, not that being a rapist is a mental disorder. Okay. It being a rapist, committing rape is stating the obvious of crime, not a mental disorder. Yeah, we don't have a psychological profile of the rapist, all righty. But it's important for us to be familiar uh, with the characteristics of rape, um, as you know, it makes us, as it I think helps us elucidate, you know, the uh, distinction between criminal behavior and a psychiatric condition. This and which uh, we just previously uh, discussed. Yeah, and with that, let me get out of this. And with that, that completes um, my discussion about gender and sexual dysfunctions and the paraphilias. And with that, uh, thank you for the privilege of your attention. And we will continue with the next chapter. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye.